Okay, right, okay, welcome back. Um, we are on lecture six, I believe. Six out of 11 for this term. And we are now in the second week of our second assignment. So hopefully um, you've made a start on the HTML and the CSS from last week's lecture. The lecture video, I apologize in advance, we had a perfect storm of issues trying to get the video on YouTube. I literally got the upload link working about 10 minutes ago. So by the time you get back after this lecture, last week's lecture will be on, on YouTube ready to look at. Now I know what I went wrong, this week should be a lot faster. Basically, um, my Mac decided to upgrade all its software at the same time, which is fine, except the um, iMovie, which I was using to edit it, now won't export on four gig, which I discovered after many failed attempts. So I should have actually ram in the computer. So it's now, it's now fixed. <coughs> Right, as promised, the first thing we're going to talk to you about is the second assignment. Um, mainly for the benefit of those who missed last week's lecture, but also just to really clarify a few things. But before we do that, um, the BIT group, I recognise faces now because I was in there yesterday. Yes? Was yesterday's lab better than the previous ones? Yeah. Would you like me to keep the same arrangement for next week yeah. and keep it going? I will do that then to make sure you, you guys are happy. Because I hadn't realised how enormous that group was. So I, I have some responsibility on that one for, for that, that issue. But uh, how do you get on with Craig, the new guy? Very good. Very good. Yeah, he's, uh, he's good, is he? So I'll ask him to carry on with that then. Now I know I've got a good egg. Yeah? Brilliant. Okay, so assignment two. Um, I'm going to put break it down bit by bit on the slides. So you've got a reference that you can look through you know, and break it into small sections. You're going to design your website, so you're going to build your website using a range of graphical tools, so use of code tools, that's wrong. Okay, the deadline for this is the 26th of November. So again, it's a four week cycle. Okay, so as long as you do your lab task each week, then you'll be on schedule for handing this in. There should be a last minute rush. What I recommend you do, it's unfortunate there's a week's delay between the lecture and the lab, isn't there? You've got the lab on lecture on Tuesday, then you've got to wait a whole week for the lab to come round. So if I were in your shoes, I would attempt the lab before the lab session, start all the tasks, and that way if you get any problems, you can get help straight away in the lab session. Because otherwise you're going to be constantly a week behind on doing the work. And this again will contribute 20% towards your final grade. I've asked the lecturers, the lab technicians, to mark your first assignment this week. So you'll get, a, you'll get a provisional grade by this time next week. I've still got to moderate it. I've got to just double check everyone's marking fairly. But you'll see a grade appear on Moodle this time next week. And the chances are that will be your grade for this assignment. It'll only be if I find any discrepancies in the marking that I'll go back and I'll make them change things. Okay? But the marking should be pretty straightforward anyway. So you pretty much know what you're going to get for this one. 20% of your final grade. <coughs> submission requirements for your second assignment it's very similar no paper-based submissions at all which is fair, is fair enough I have to say that otherwise people can have an excuse um, I want the PDF document just as before this time if you handed your work in as a word document I've marked your card this assignment but I will mark your work as well so I'll, I'll mark your work this time only if you hand it in the word document I want a PDF document only, please. It's generally a very bad idea to use proprietary tools to submit anything to anyone. PDF is universal, you should be using PDF. <laughs> okay, so PDF only for the assignment, please, but this time we will be lenient on you. Um, and then instead of a, a Photoshop file, you're going to zip your website up, a, 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 a zip copy of your website for marking. There's a 20 meg limit on the upload. The last time you had problems with Photoshop files, didn't you? Big Photoshop files. If your website is and your report come to more than 20 meg, you've done something wrong. If your website comes to more than five, four, five meg, you've done something wrong because we're looking at HTML and CSS files, which are text files, aren't they? And if you haven't optimized your graphics properly, so they've got huge graphics, then you don't deserve a mark. So 20 megs should be plenty for this assignment, so you shouldn't have to use things like Dropbox and Box this time. Um, 
a zip file please yes i know there's raw and there's all these other formats but i don't want to go through the hassle of having to download extra software to unzip your files so pdf for the document zip for the files right i want to keep it really simple if you hand your work in late this last assignment technically we're not supposed to mark it but i'm a softie at heart so this time only okay if it was a few minutes late after midnight you know the usual sort of um issues this time we will mark them next time we will not mark them okay so we've been lenient because it's the first cycle right your first task is you're going to build some html pages now we've been splitting hairs on this one with people coming to chat to me can it be three html documents can it be one and a half what do i put on my pages I'm going to say something very dangerous at this point. Use your common sense. I, I know in a university environment it's very dangerous, very dangerous to do that. Further back, further back. Yeah. It's very dangerous to say that in a university environment, but common sense dictates that you have to use a bit of common sense on this one. The first task, I want you to demonstrate that you can do a range of HTML tags. So you might do for a list, you might say, actually, I want to do a table, you know, because I want to have my results in the table, I'll create a nice little table. Do that. You might say, actually, I'll play with lists and with bullets as well and numbers. Do that as well. This first task is for you to play with the different formats and try things out. <coughs> there is no right or wrong answer, but obviously the more you try out and the more skills you demonstrate, the higher the grade is going to be for this task. So two pages is going to get you three marks out of five. If you do more pages or demonstrate more techniques and do more exciting things, you're going to get a higher grade. So please be aware of that. The important thing is, I want single style sheet. So both pages will link to the same style sheet. So if I modify the style sheet to change the paragraph color, I expect to see both pages change. That's non-negotiable. Um, you're going to use semantic HTML. There's no layouts in here, there's no graphics in here because I haven't shown you that stuff yet. All I want is simple semantic HTML. So you can change the spacing of your paragraphs, you can change your fonts, you can change your font families, you can change your, um, your colors, yeah? All those sort of things. Because I want you to really focus on that for this first lab task, okay? Don't get distracted with the fancy graphics. Are there any questions about that task? Is that clear as mud? You know what you're doing with that task. The second task, however, which is what we're talking about in this session, we're going to start looking at layouts. Now, this is really important. You don't change your HTML document. Okay, the only document that will, that will create your layout is your CSS file. So in other words, I want you to separate out the semantic structure of your page, which is HTML, from the look of your page, which is CSS. <coughs> and the layout is part of the look. So for example, your banner graphics that you're putting in, you're going to reference your banner graphics in your CSS file. Because a banner graphic is not part of the page content, is it? A photograph of a product would be the page content, wouldn't it? You know, if it was, say, um, you know, um, an eBay account, an eBay page, the photograph of the product you're selling would be the content, but the eBay logo on the page would be the style of the page. So some graphics will go in the HTML if they're part of the page content. Some graphics will go in the style sheet if they're part of the page style. And you must separate those two out. So if you don't separate them out, you're going to be getting ones and twos. If you separate them out really effectively, you're getting threes and fours. If you do a beautiful job of this, you're going to get the fours and fives. So that's, that, again, is non-negotiable. So any questions about task two before we move on to task three? So by now, you should have some standalone pages which have looked really good and nice. Yeah, with some content on them that looks really, really pretty. The third task is navigation. I'm going to be showing you how you do things like rows of buttons, horizontal rows and vertical rows. I'm going to be showing you how to um, do drop down lists, if you want to do drop down <coughs> lists, simply using CSS. What's important is when you do your HTML, 
all navigation should first of all be navigation tags remember the html5 tag we have for navigation but also all navigation starts its life as bullets whether it's a drop down list whether it's a list of buttons horizontal list or vertical list so all you have to do up to this point is put your links in bullet points this session i'll show you how to turn those crude bullet points into these drop down menus into these nice buttons rollovers and so on okay but navigation should be buttons should be a bullets because if you think about semantically it's a list of links isn't it navigation and lists go in lists go in bullets or numbers so we're going to talk about navigation and how you build beautiful navigation structures for your pages the final session <coughs> slightly left field we're going to have lots of fun with micro data and search engine optimization micro data is the stuff that you put in your page and when you get your search results come up you might have your photograph next to the page it might have its rating site which it should be the star rating of the rating you've given the product should appear in the google search results page the date of the review should appear as a proper date in the results and that's adding micro data to your html documents and i'll show you some tools which google give you to show how it's going to look in the search results so we go through the whole process and then we'll talk about metadata search engine optimization we'll talk about bots we'll talk about all the things you need to be aware of when you're building a website that has to be found on the internet as you notice once you get past the first task you're not changing your html at all well apart from this one this last task you modify your html not your css so task one is html and css together task two is pure css task three is pure css and task four is pure html so we're going to be working on those two files balancing them juggling them to get a beautiful website ready for the third assignment which is dynamic database driven content so there are the four tasks are you comfortable with those four tasks for this assignment if you're not sure then you have your supervisors in the lab to ask questions of uh, i write a briefing sheet every week which all supervisors get explaining what the tasks are for that week and any any gotchas if there's a contradiction between what the supervisor says and what the assignment says and there's some ambiguity there are forums every week on moodle there's a question and answer forum all you have to do is stick a question in there and i'll answer it no, overnight. Right. All HTML elements, i.e. tags, occupy boxes on the screen, rectangular spaces on the screen. So if you color the back, have changed the background color on any of your tags, you would see a little rectangular box appearing. Now, some boxes are standalone, like P tags and heading tags, but some boxes like strong and emphasis tags are in line, aren't they? In hyperlink tags, you'd see a box inside the box really important that you get your head around this because this is the fundamental unit of building layout now we produce layouts by shuffling these boxes around on the screen like a sliding box puzzle so we slide these boxes around the screen and position them relative to each other and that gives us our layout so when you design your pages it's always a very good idea to use the spectrum the primary colors and give each of your elements a nice bright background color so you can see where the box is so then as you're positioning things it's like lego bricks you can see what's going on once you've positioned everything you can change the color to more subtle colors or get rid of the colors but always good to have a nice bright color in the background so you can see what's going on <coughs> right this is the sort of the master slide for this session there's lots of css properties which you need to be aware of in fact there are one two three four five six different properties and this is how they interact with each other so you have your content your paragraph or whatever and you can assign it a width you can give it a height but obviously that means the text might get cut off if you're not careful so you have a width and a height we're going to focus on the width for the purpose of this demonstration so let's imagine you give your content a width of 200 pixels all right you with me so far this content sits inside a bigger box which has a border around it so you can see that I've got this, this blue box that's inside the big white box. Can you see that? The space between the blue box and the white box is called padding. 
And when you colour your box in, if you put pad in, you'll get a bit of space between the contents and the box. It just pushes things in slightly so you've got a bit of breathing space around your elements. So when we calculate the width of the element, we take the width of the content and we add the width of the left padding and the width of the right padding. OK, you with me so far? So the box is bigger than the width measurement already. We then have a border around it, which can be any width of pixels. So then to calculate the width again, we have to add the width, the left border and the right border. And suddenly your box is bigger, isn't it? It's growing. Then outside the box, we have another couple of properties. One is called outline, but we'll talk about that in a minute. The important one is margin. What margin does, it pushes that element away from other elements on the page. So if you've got two paragraph tags like that, and you put a margin of 10 pixels on that one, and a margin of 20 pixels on this one, this 10 margin pixels, this 10 pixel margin says, I've got to be at least 10 pixels away from the next element. But the one underneath has a 20 pixel margin, so it says I need to be 20 pixels away. So you end up with a 20 pixel gap between them, not 30. That specifies the minimum space around the element. That makes sense. That's really confuses people when you've got two elements with margins, how those margins interact with each other. <coughs> Round the margin space, you have what's called an outline. I've never ever used the outline property apart from when I'm trying to work out how elements are positioned on the screen. It's a nice tool to see where the margins come to. So you can see how things lay out with each other. But those are the properties you need to be aware of. The interesting thing about the outline, though, is if you give the outline a one pixel margin, it doesn't increase the size of the element at all. It has no effect at all. So secretly, I think they put it in there to make your life a bit easier when you design your layouts. I've never seen a final design with, a, with an outline property. So can you see now how those six properties interact with each other? Can you see how that works? OK, so I'm going to go through some CSS for each one, just to give you a, a, an idea. I can't teach you the whole topic. I can give you ideas and thoughts and suggestions, which you, you then go away and you, you play with them, you break your web page design. You think, oh, that didn't work. So you try something else, and that breaks as well. And then it suddenly shoots off to the top left-hand corner for no apparent reason. And you keep playing with it. The only way to learn CSS and layouts is to play and break things. You learn more from breaking something. It's like the Robinsons, isn't it? You learn more from breaking something with it not working than you do if it works. So what we do have got here, there's my width and height of my page content. OK, so there's my page content. Everything's, uh, everything's nice and easy, 400 by 200 pixels. Could you jangle those keys any louder? Well, sit further back and ask someone to move up a little bit or move back or something. If you walk in front of the camera, it's going to look really daft, isn't it? Or come down the next aisle where there's seats on both sides of the aisle completely free. OK. So width and height, we specify that. I have a PhD in sarcasm, as you probably noticed. So padding. Now, this is really interesting. I can apply padding to the whole of the element. So padding 20 says put padding on the top, the bottom, the left, and the right at the same time. And nine times out of 10, that's what you probably want. Alternatively, I can apply padding to one of the four sides independently. Now, <coughs> let's imagine both those are in the same CSS file. What's going to happen? What will my final padding be? Yes, it'll be 30 on the top and 20 on the rest. This is what's called a cascade. Cascading style sheets means it starts at the top and works its way down and just applies everything it finds, one after the other. So first of all, it applies 20 to everything. And the next line says, oh, 30 on the bottom. So it adds 30 to the bottom. If they were the other way around, you'd end up with 20 pixels padding all the way around because it works from top to bottom. Again, there's my border. Now, border, you've actually got three properties. You can actually say border thickness, border, sorry, border width, border style, border color. I prefer to slap it all together in the same, in the same line. 
So I have a three pixel dashed red border around my element. But I've now said my border left is actually now two pixels thick, solid, and a sort of um, very pale grey colour. Because <coughs> you get good at spotting these colours after a while. If all the letters are, everything's the same, it's grey. So again, there's the cascade in place. And can you see that I've separated them into separate lines to make it easier to read with semicolon, so it's all nice and easily laid out. Margin, just like padding. I can have margin all the way around, I can have margin on a particular side. I can have M's, pixels, points, centimetres, whatever measurement I want to use. I tend to work with pixels when I'm working on layouts. Now this is interesting. If I, have, if I want my element centred on the screen, or centred inside the, the uh, parent element, if, if the browser gets wider or narrower, I'd have to recalculate my left and right padding, wouldn't I, to make sure everything evens, evens out. There's a special option called Auto. If I set my margin left and margin right to Auto, it will automatically try and match them, make them the same. So I can have a nice web page, which no matter how big or narrow my web browser becomes, the content's always centred in the screen. I give it a width, I set margin auto to the sides, and it just automatically centres itself on the screen. Okay, outline we've talked about. Positioning. Right, this is where get, people get really confused. There are different positioning modes in HTML. Different positioning modes. Static, fixed, relative, and absolute. And there are even experienced web developers who still haven't got their heads around what these mean. Um, I'll summarise it here, then I'll go through each of them in turn to explain in detail how that works. And I'll put a little bit of CSS to show you how we use them. And again, <coughs> practice. Static is the default. You place a paragraph under a heading one, it just sits underneath it, and it flows down the page. You've seen that, haven't you, with the HTML? It's the default layout approach. Everything just flows one after, one after the other. Fixed is an interesting one. If you make something fixed, positioning fixed, it's relative to the browser window. So if you want a, a navigation or banner which sticks to the top of the page and doesn't move, you'd say you'd make it fixed. If you want a footer, in fact, who was it who mentioned footers in the lab yesterday? There was a question, wasn't there, about that? I'll give you the code. You sorted it, okay. But it's fixed. Ah, that sort of pushed it. <coughs> Relative is an interesting one. Relative is an offset. So if you want your paragraph to move up slightly, where it is, you can say you can make it relative and say um, top minus 20 and it'll move up 20 pixels. So that's relative to where it is at the moment. An absolute is relative to its parent. So if you've got a header tag and you've got a heading one inside it, if you make the heading one absolute, it positions itself relative to the header tag. So it's relative to its parent, not to the browser. Of course, its parent might be the browser, if it's the HTML tag, for instance. So there's your fixed footer. So we say position fixed, which immediately says, right, this is relative to the browser window. Left zero pixels, bang, against the left-hand edge. Right, sorry, um, bottom zero pixels, with the 100%. Why don't I specify right, by the way? Why don't I need right? It's linked to the left at the bottom, but I haven't specified right. It could keep going. And I've said 100% width, haven't I, on it? 100% width means it's going to push all the way across anyway. Um, background colour, height 30 pixels, there's my fixed footer. Okay, by using the position fixed. Okay, here's position relative. My paragraphs, I'm going to shift them top minus 20, which means they'll still shift up 20 pixels, and left 20, which means they'll push across 20 pixels. So that's my kind of fine tuning, my just tweaking the positions of things, just making sure they're exactly where I want them. We very rarely use position relative. It's, it's dangerous, because as soon as you start adding more things, it all starts blowing up and it's a mess. Try it, okay? Experience the pain of relative layouts. Here's my absolute. This will, this will shove the item top left, 100 pixels in from the left, 
150 pixels down from the top. Okay, so this is kind of useful if it's relative to, um, if you want your, your heading in your header, your heading one to be positioned precisely relative to the box. That makes sense. And we get on to floats. Floats are the magic ingredient that allows us to do complicated layouts. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk you through the principles first of all. I've actually got um, some nice graphics to show you the principles, and then we'll dive into a real example with some code. So you see the concepts first, so you get your head around how floats work, and then I'll show you the code that goes behind it. All right, we have floating. A floated element will move as far left or right as it can. So if you float an image, float left, it will shove the image to the left-hand edge. If you float right, it will push the image all the way across the right-hand edge. The magic thing, though, is anything that follows it gets pushed up next to it. So it flows around it. So if I've got an image, then a paragraph, and I float the image left, the paragraph will move up to the right and flow around it. You know, just like, like in a word processor. And clear, we'll talk about in a moment. Okay, there's my classic page layout. Okay, there's my pale blue box is actually div ID page. Okay, because I want it to be fixed width. So I put a div in there and I make it width 800 pixels, margin auto. And that means it floats in the middle of the page. With me so far. And because I've got the start, I haven't changed the position styles, I've got a nice red image in there. I've got some blue text and there's my little footer at the bottom of the page, my orange footer. So that's what you get before you start playing with floats and margins. Okay, you with me so far? <coughs> what I'm now going to do, that image, I'm going to give it a width of 100 pixels, so I can guarantee the width of the image, and float left. It could be a paragraph, it doesn't have to be an image. Can you see what's happened to my text? Can you see what's going on there? The text is flowing around that floated element. I'm trying to get two columns in my design. That's my eventual aim. But can you see what's the problem with getting two nice columns? What happens to the text when it gets under the image? What goes on? What happens to it? it flows back, doesn't it, underneath the image? What have I taught you? How do you push content away from its container? What's the property? Hmm? Margins. So to fix this, all I have to do is give that main content a bit of a margin left. You see, because that will push it away, won't it, from the side. And if I were to get rid of that red colour behind there and just have images or text in there, you would see a two-column design, wouldn't you? That's how we do two-column designs. If you want a three-column design, you'd have a second div which you'd, which you'd float right. And then you'd put margin left and right on the bit in the middle, and that would flow down the middle. And you've got a three-column design. And this works for any number of columns because you can take one of those columns and float things inside that column and create multiple sub-columns and do what you want to it. Okay, that looks good, doesn't it? Fine and dandy. There is one problem. What is going to happen? What hap or put another way, if my red text gets long and my blue text gets shorter, what's going to happen to my footer? The footer will try and flow around the red box, won't it? I won't have a footer anymore. It'll look a bit like that. It's a mess, isn't it? That's because the red has the float on it, doesn't it? Which means everything else has to float around it. So it'll just, everything will push up and push up and push up until it's exhausted. What we want to do is move that footer below the float, don't we? That's the, what we need to do. Like that. And there's a magic a magic uh, property you have called clear. Clear left says it will clear any floating left floats before it positions itself. There's clear left and there's clear right. So if you had three column design, you'd simply clear left and clear right. And what that does, it won't, it'll push the footer down until it's cleared any floating elements on the page. You see how that, how that works now? So now I have a perfect solution. My left column can be as long or short as it wants to be. My right column can be as long or short as it wants to be and it will still work perfectly and my footer will sit at the bottom and all that's achieved 
If that red stuff was navigation, I would apply that style to the navigation tag. So my navigation tag would have a width, it would have float left. If this is my article, the blue stuff's my article, I can apply the style, the blue style to my article tag, can't I? I haven't added any more HTML to this at all, have I? There's no additional HTML in my page. I've simply attached styles to the elements that already exist. So I'm going to do an example, as we've got time, of how we do this for real, using actual screenshots from web browsers to show the process. And I'll cover a few extra gotchas as we go through it. So first step, create your HTML page, obviously. Second step, have a style sheet attached to it, obvious step. So there's my simple style sheet with my link. I've put this together so you can use it as a reference tool. So I've, I've put the, the presentation is currently on Moodle, so you can always look at this and look through what I've put in there to help you out with your, with your designs. <coughs> we have a problem initially. Remember I told you, told you about the browser style sheet? Every web browser has a built-in style sheet which gives it the margins and the paddings around the paragraphs and the headings, which is why it looks so awful. That's why you've got a huge space between paragraphs because there's a margin between the paragraphs. It's, it gets worse. Every browser has different settings. So Explorer has different margins and paddings from Firefox and Chrome. So the first thing we've got to do is get rid of every bit of margin and padding for every element on that page. Okay, because otherwise you're going to get caught up where you leave a mar default margin and it changes when you change browsers. So that's the magic source to make your life easier. That asterisk says apply this style to everything. And I always include that at the top of my style sheet. <coughs> It basically just gives you, a, gives you a nice plain canvas to work with. There's no nasty margins and paddings to catch you out. What will happen at that point is your page will look awful because it will also get rid of the margins and paddings around your bullets, around your paragraphs, around your headings, and everything will collapse together. That's exactly what we want because now we can apply our own margins and paddings to produce our own layout, can't we? We've just erased all the, all the any, any remaining style from the page. <coughs> Fixed width layout. Generally, most web pages are fixed width layouts, aren't they? You make the web browser wider or narrower, you end up with space at the side. It's incredibly difficult to do a variable width web page because your Im images would have to somehow scale and it's, it's a mess. So what I do is I create a page ID, an ID page div, and give it the width of 800 pixels, set the margins, give it a nice pale color that I can see, and when I launch the page with something inside it, I should see a nice grey box, 800 pixels wide. And then when I change the web browser width, it should automatically stay at 800 pixels all the time. So that's the trick. In fact, I've made the body grey and the background colour of the, of the div light grey. So it'll be a dark grey page with a lighter grey box on it. And that's what I get. And can you see how, it's, because I've got rid of the margins and the paddings, it's squashed that against the top edge, hasn't it? Top edge of the screen. It's 800 pixels wide, but it's squashed against the top. So my first step is let it breathe. Let's make sure we've always got 15 pixel margin at the top and 15 pixels at the bottom. Just a bit of breathing space so it's not squashed against the top and bottom. There you are. That looks better, doesn't it? A bit of space at the top. It's always still horribly squashed together at the moment, and we've got no content in the page. But there's my building block, isn't it, to get a nice page layout. There's my foundations. There's my concrete I've just poured in. Header, footer, navigation, page content. You've got four sections, haven't you, on any page. You've got your header tag for your header. You've got your footer tag for your footer. You've got your navigation tag for your navigation. And then you can use the article tag or a div tag or something to contain the content. So that's a very simple example. There's my header tag. My H group tag, it allows me to group my heading elements together so they're treated as one. It just, I put that in because that way I can grab the whole of the header group in one style and apply something to both. Yep. Yeah. Uh, my footer with a paragraph, my content here, ID main. I haven't put navigation in for some reason, but we'll come back to that. And there we are. There's my header, my content, my footer. There's no colour in there. I can't see what's going on. So we put some colour in. 
tan, dark sea green linen, just use anything you want, as long as the colours are different. And now, can you see straight away, you can see where the header is, you can see where the content is, and you can see where the footer is. By putting any old colours in, your life is much easier. You can see where elements are. Now we're going to have navigation and content. So in my, in my page, I'm going to have a navigation tag and a content tag in there. Nav and ID, ID equals content. So I've now got a way of separating those two elements so I can create my two columns, haven't I? I could have my content, con ID content A, ID content B, couldn't I? I've separated that that way. Or I could use my side column for my, my sides and have the article in the centre bit. And yeah, Indian red, light blue. There you are. And because it's the default, the default um, structure, I've got navigation, content, footer. Remember, it flows from top to bottom by default, doesn't it? Yeah, my box model, my position style. Now we get more interested. There's my nav, and there's my content. I put width rather than margin left on that one, so a bit. I've got actually I'm floating one beach way on this one. I probably should have checked this one. So width 200, float left. Content width 600, float right. So I'm, I'm doing two floats in this example. One to float left, one to float right. Um, <coughs> <coughs> and there's my content in place. You see? 